finishing off our series in the book of Genesis this week here. Uh, we started off at the beginning of Genesis, and we've learned so far that sin has entered the world and that humanity is in bondage to the devil. We have seen that uh, uh, humanity has made choices, and uh, they've chosen to go against God, and as a result, sin has entered the world. And... Um, Today we come to the story of Joseph. It starts in Genesis 37 and leads all the way on through to the end of the book. So it's quite a big part of the book. And his story uh, goes on, like I said, to the end of the book. So I I just want to close our series today just talking about Joseph. And the first half of Joseph's story is not a great story. The first half of Joseph's story is a story of constant struggle. Uh, Joseph experiences a lot of adversity in the first part of his life. Joseph starts off as the favorite son. His father loves him. Joseph is one of Jacob's youngest sons. He comes along when Jacob is an older man, and uh, Jacob loves him, and he makes no attempts to hide his love for this particular son. And, and man, choosing favorites leads to nothing but struggle in Joseph's life. His father gives him a beautiful coat. It's an expensive coat. It's an outlandish coat. And it sparks jealousy amongst Joseph's brothers. When his brothers saw that their their father loved Joseph more than he loved them, the Bible says that they hated him and they could say nothing kind to him. And this makes Joseph's life difficult. Joseph was a dreamer. Uh, Joseph, uh, God would give him dreams. And in one of his dreams, he saw sheaves of grain blowing in the wind And the sheaf that represented Joseph rose up higher than the other sheaves. And the sheaves representing his brothers bowed down before Joseph at his feet. And his brothers hated him because they were jealous of him. And they said, what? We're we're older than you. There is no way that we're going to bow down before you. That is not ever going to happen. And then Joseph's brothers plotted to murder him. And and, uh, they didn't like Joseph's attitude. They thought he was being proud. They thought he believed he was better than they were. And maybe Joseph, being young, he didn't come across in the best way uh, possible. So they plotted to murder him. And they threw him in the bottom of a pit, thinking they were going to leave him there and just let him die in the bottom of this pit. And then one of his brothers spoke up and said, no, let's not do this. Let's sell him uh, uh, into slavery. They sold him to some slave traders who were on their way to Egypt. When Joseph gets to Egypt, he's sold to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar is an important man in Egypt. He works for the king. And then Joseph is falsely accused by his boss's wife. Joseph is a handsome young man and Potiphar's wife is attracted to him. She makes a move on him and she pressures him day after day for many months. Come with me, be with me. But he refuses and he says no. And one day all the servants are out of the house and it was just Joseph and Potiphar's wife in the house and she made another move on him. But he resisted again. This time she caught hold of his cloak and he ran out and he left the house She screamed, and when her servants came into the house, she said, look what this man has done to me. He he made a move on me, but I screamed for help, and he ran away. Look, he left his cloak behind. So she falsely accused Joseph, and Joseph ended up in prison for several years. While he was in prison, the king's baker and the king's cupbearer were thrown into prison with Joseph because the king was angry at them. And this cupbearer and this baker They both have dreams while they're in prison, and Joseph is good at interpreting dreams. So he says, tell me your dreams, and Joseph interprets their dreams, and he says to the cupbearer, in three days, the king is going to lift up your head, and you're going to be restored to your position, and you're going to be back serving the king as his cupbearer. Joseph says to the baker, in three days, the king's going to lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds are going to eat your flesh Uh, How's that for an interpretation to a dream? Um, And within three days, these interpretations come true. The baker loses his head. The cupbearer is restored to working for the king. And Joseph says, please don't forget about me. When you're with the king, please don't forget about me. But the cupbearer breaks his promise. He forgets about Joseph. So Joseph's life is filled with broken promises. The promise he had as a child, as a favorite son, The promise is gone. The dreams that he had as a young man about his brothers bowing down to him, that promise is gone. And now the promise that the cupbearer made to him to tell him the king about him, that promise is broken as well. So Joseph is stuck in prison 
a life full of broken promises. But what we're about to discover is that there are really two stories that are going on here. And this is true for your life as well. There's this lower story, that's the story that Joseph sees. And, and this story, that's the story that Joseph is living out day to day. And then there's the upper story, and that's the story that God sees. That's the story from God's perspective. You see, just like Joseph, you have a lower story, the story that you can see. And you have an upper story, you have a story that God sees. And sometimes when you look at your lower story, it seems like God has forgotten you. Let me ask you, have you ever wanted to rewrite your story? Maybe there's some chapters in your life that were just so tough and just so difficult and they just don't make any sense. And you wonder, what was the purpose of that chapter of my life? Why did I go through that? That doesn't make any sense to me. It was so hard and I don't see any value to it. And you say, I wish I could rewrite the story of my life so that I didn't experience that. Maybe it was a time when you were mistreated and bullied through no fault of your own, or maybe you were a victim of an orchestrated campaign of slander and lies directed towards you, or maybe you were falsely accused of things that ironically you had tried hard not to do, and uh, maybe somebody has hurt you in some way, or if you've been a, a victim of some kind of injustice and it has caused you to withdraw or you found yourself becoming angry and bitter at people, but maybe even at God himself. And it may seem to you that God has forgotten about you. And when we go through adversity, when we go through struggles, we often ask God, why? Why is it that someone who is doing all the wrong things, why are you blessing them? And, And why would you allow me to go through all of this hardship when I am trying to do my best and I am following you? And I am obeying you. God, where are you in all of my struggles? And sometimes when we look at the lower story of our lives, when we look at only what we can see, it seems like there's no purpose in our struggle. You see, Joseph's story starts off with so many bad chapters that as you read the story, you wonder, okay, God, you know, this guy's life is really bad. Why don't you give this guy a break? Once you read the first part of his story, you wonder how he ever actually survived and live through what he went through. And when you go through those kind of seasons in your life, you start to wonder, God, what in the world are you doing in my life? That's the Joseph question. God, what in the world are you doing in my life? What is the purpose in all of this struggle? Is there a purpose or is it all random? Is God at work through this or is he not at work in this? How much of our life is coincidence? How much of our life is random events? Is God in control or is God not in control? If anyone had a reason to question God, it was Joseph. If anyone could have claimed he was the victim and the world was against him, it was this young man. If anyone could have ever felt that God had forgotten about him, it was this young man. I'm sure that if Joseph could rewrite his story, there are whole chapters that he would want to leave out. In Joseph's ideal world, his brothers would love him and would accept him. He wouldn't be sold into slavery. He wouldn't have gone to prison, but that's not the story that he got. What, what story did you get? I'm guessing that there's pages that you wish that you could just rip out of your life story. But I wanna tell you this, the whole story matters. Every crossed out word matters. Every paragraph that you wanna erase matters. Every page that you want to rip out of your story matters. Your worst moments, your hardest struggles have the potential to become God's greatest miracles in your life. You see, God takes the hard things and he uses them to showcase his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness to create a new beginning. Your worst scenes become God's best scenes. Your pain can become a portal of God's grace Your ravaged pages can become God's redemptive masterpiece. And that's because there's also an upper story. There's a story from God's perspective. The upper story is the bigger picture plan of God in your life. You see, there's this interplay between the human will and between God's sovereignty. There's the lower story where we make choices, we make decisions about our life. And then there's the upper story where God has an overall plan. And in the story of Joseph, both of those are happening at once. 
When the story finally ends in Genesis 50, Joseph says this. He says to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended this for good. And we've seen this all throughout Genesis so far. There are some events that happen through the choices of others. Adam and Eve made a choice to go against God. Cain makes a choice to ignore God's warning about the power of sin. The people of Genesis 6 make choices to go against God. The people of Genesis 11 make choices to go against God. And then Abraham makes a choice to believe God and to trust God and to follow God. And then there are some events in our lives that God intends to happen. God tells Eve that a promised seed is going to come, a descendant who's going to crush the head of the serpent and rescue humanity from its bondage to evil and to sin. So in the midst of human choice, God intends to do some things, but sometimes both are happening at once. Sometimes people are making choices and God is intending things and both are happening at the same time. That's what happens in Joseph's life. Joseph's brothers are making choices to harm him, but God has an intention in their choice and he's using it for his good and for his glory. God sees the upper story and there's a problem that's gonna come to Egypt and that's gonna wipe out many people and God is gonna need someone in Egypt who's going to trust him and follow him. And so in the upper story, God sends Joseph to become leader over all of Egypt. Joseph ends up in Egypt in prison. This is exactly where God wants him to be because the king of Egypt has a dream about a famine that's coming and he can't understand the dream and the king of Egypt is calling for anyone who can interpret the dream. And so it so happens by God's design that the king's cupbearer is standing right beside him as the king is saying, I need somebody to interpret this dream. And he says, guess what? I know a guy who interprets dreams. I met him in prison. So the king of Egypt calls in Joseph and Joseph interprets the dream. And the dream is about seven years of abundant crops and then seven years of famine. And Joseph tells the king that the only way to survive the famine is if the king mandates, and hear that word mandates, that people give one fifth of every harvest to the king and that they save the grain and that when the famine comes, they hand out the excess grain to the people. The king sees that God's hand is on Joseph. He, so he puts Joseph in charge of this whole project and Joseph becomes the second most important leader in the entire country. And Joseph saves his family. When the famine comes, it affects Joseph's family and his brothers come to Egypt and, and they're looking for food so that they can survive. And guess who's there? Their brother Joseph that they sold into slavery. They willed him gone, but God needed him in Egypt to save their lives. And Joseph had gone ahead of them and they end up bowing down before him and begging for his help. So Joseph's dream comes true. And Joseph is reunited with his father. Eventually the whole family moves to Egypt and all ends well. And this is what we see when we look at the upper story. We discover that we have a God who is with us in the lower story, it looks like God is not there. In the upper story, the Lord is there. He's with Joseph the entire time. God is intentionally allowing these things to happen in Joseph's life because God is preparing Joseph and God is positioning Joseph to be in the right place at the right time. So when you go through adversity, when you go through struggles, when you have this guarantee that you can know that the Lord is with you, and you can stand there and say, the Lord stood with me and the Lord gave me strength. The same God who was with Joseph when he was sold into slavery is the same God who is with you in whatever you're facing today. The same God who was with Joseph when he was unjustly accused and put in prison for many years is the same God who is with you when you are unfairly accused. The same God who was with Joseph when he was summoned before Pharaoh is the same God who is with you just let that soak into your spirit. He is with you. He is with you when things are going great, when you're the favored child, in your years of, of dreaming. He is with you when you and your family are prospering. He is with you in humiliation, when things are at their worst and nothing is going right, when you think you're alone, when you think that you've been abandoned and no one understands, God is with you. 
The Lord is standing with you in your adversity. The Lord is standing with you in your struggles. This is a bedrock truth. No matter what you are walking through, no matter what you will walk through, you will never be alone because God will be with you. We have a Lord who is with us. The upper story shows us that God is preparing you for his intended plan. When Joseph finally sees the end of the story, he is able to say, I understand. I know what God was doing. You intended to harm me. I could be bitter about what you did to me. I could enact vengeance for what you did to me. You intended to harm me. You sold me into slavery, but God intended it for good. Joseph finally sees that all of his struggle, all of these problems, all of these situations, God was using them, each and every one of them, to prepare him for his purpose. So when you're stuck in the lower story, you need to be able to say, you know, I don't understand what's going on here, but somehow God is preparing me for bigger things. Somehow God is preparing me for something that he has intended for me to do. You see, Joseph sees, my brothers plotted to murder me, my brothers threw me into slavery, but God sees that he needed to humble Joseph. See, at the start of the story, Joseph is a bit of a jerk to his brothers because God is showing him all these dreams and they're going to Joseph's head and his head is expanding and his pride is expanding and it reaches the point where his brothers say to him, so you think that you're gonna be our king, do you? Do you actually think that you're gonna reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way that he talked about them. So Joseph has a bit of a problem and God can't use him if he is arrogant. God can't use him if he is cocky or proud. God can't use him as a leader if he is a jerk to other people, if people don't like him. If his own brothers can't stand him, then God can't use him. So God has to take him through this journey, and a part of that journey is to humble him. And maybe the struggles that you have, maybe God has put them into your life because there's a lesson that he needs to teach you. And maybe that lesson is about pride or, or some other character trait that God knows needs to change in you in order for you to be ready for what he has for you to do. In the lower story, you say, hey God, you know, why are you letting this happen to me? But in the upper story, God sees that there's a character trait within you that needs to change. And he needs to humble you or he needs to round out that part of your character in order to pre prepare you for his purpose and for his plans in your life. And as difficult as adversity is, if you can just ask yourself, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me here? What character trait are you working on in my life right now? And God is also teaching Joseph endurance. Joseph is going to need a lot of endurance in order to persevere through this 14 year process of saving people from this famine because people aren't gonna want to give up their grain just think of how hard it has been for us to watch government leaders mandate stuff. Imagine how hard it's gonna be for Joseph to mandate that people give up one-fifth of their grain every year for seven years. Joseph is gonna need endurance in order to be the leader who can save the entire nation. What is God teaching you? If you're in a season of adversity, what is God teaching you? Maybe it's patience. Maybe it's about learning to find joy in the midst of this moment and just not be worried about tomorrow and how things are gonna work out. Maybe God is just saying, just chill, just relax. Maybe God is teaching you to find contentment. The most powerful tool that you can have in your life is contentment. You always want more, but God is saying, be content with what you have. You want that vacation. God says, be content with what you have. You wanna buy that house. God says, be content with what you have. You want that job? God said, be, says, be content with what you have. So in your adversity, God is teaching you something. What is God teaching you? And also God is preparing Joseph for leadership. The leader who is gonna be able to embrace this challenge is the leader who relies on God for strength and the leader who gives glory to God for everything that is about to happen. When Joseph is young, he says, listen to my dream. Listen to my dream. And then he's in prison and he says, well, God can fulfill dreams, but I can interpret dreams. And then finally, when he meets the king, he says this. He says, it is beyond my power to do this, 
but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. And that's the secret. That's the secret to godly leadership. It is beyond my power to do this, but God can do it. God can do it. I can't do it, but God can do it. And that's the secret to godly leadership, understanding, okay, there's certain things that I can do, but this is just bigger than me. This is God's plan. This is God's thing. And I'm here to help it happen. That's my role. This is not the Joseph show. This is the God show. This is something that God is gonna do. And maybe if God took you out of this season of adversity, and maybe if he removed you from it too soon, you would say, hey, look what I did. Look at me, look at how great my business is. Look at how great my work is. Look at how skilled I am. But God needs to keep you in this adversity just a little while longer because he needs to bring you to a place where you can say, it's not me, it's God. It's not anything that I have done. This is something that God has done. And finally, the king says this, you'll be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a higher rank than yours. The struggles along the way are only meant to prepare you for your purpose. So what is God preparing you for? Sharon Janes tells the story of a woman named Patricia. She was married for 23 years. It was the worst marriage that you could imagine. She could do nothing right. She could do nothing to please this guy. In 23 years, she left him, or he left her four separate times, always came back, begged her to take him back. And finally, after 23 loveless years, he left her and divorced her. And a friend asked her, what made you stay with your husband for all of these years? And she said, well, I prayed about it and I never felt a peace about leaving. I knew that God was bigger than any of the problems that I had. I prayed that my husband would see Jesus in me and he didn't change, but I have no regrets. And this is what she said after 23 years of hell on earth. She says this, if my life had been easy, I would have ended up with a flabby faith that could maybe quote scripture, but not necessarily believe it. I would have grown spiritually sloppy rather than spiritually strong, but I had to depend on God. I had to depend on God to provide for me and my children, especially emotionally, because she says, because I had to depend on God's love for me when I didn't get it from my husband, I know now the depths of God's love for me. Because I had to stand on God's word when the world was falling apart around me, I know the rock on which my feet are planted. Had I not gone through those difficult times, I would not have the trust that I have today in God. He gives me life and he is my life. And she's able to say, because I went through this, I am somebody stronger, I am somebody wiser, I am somebody, somebody gentler. So God has a purpose in your adversity. What is God's greater purpose in this adversity that you're going through? What is God's purpose? What is God teaching you? How is God trying to grow your character? That's what God is doing in Joseph's life. God is preparing him for his intended plan. And Joseph discovers that God is positioning you for his intended work. Look at what Joseph says next. He's seeing this upper story. He's seeing now what God has done. He says, you intended to harm me. God intended it for good. And then he says this, God brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. God is positioning Joseph to save his family. His family is saved from this famine, a situation that would have killed them if God had not sent him ahead to Egypt. God is positioning Joseph to save many people, the entire country, and many of the surrounding countries were saved because God placed Joseph in Egypt. And God is positioning Joseph to preserve the promised seed Watch this, by the end of Genesis, we get this clue to where the promised seed is going. It was with Eve, then it was with Abraham, then it was with Isaac, and then with Jacob, and now at the end of Genesis, we see that it's with Judah. Genesis 49 verse 10 says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. And that sounds a lot like it's pointing towards Jesus because ultimately it is. At this point, we don't know that it's about Jesus. We just know that the promised seed is now with Judah. Just as God used Joseph to save the entire nation, this promised seed is going to be the one who's gonna save 
the entire world. So what's God positioning you for? Today, Patricia is in her 60s. She's married to a great guy who loves her, who cherishes her. Her three children are all grown up and they love, their love for Jesus is strong. And this is what she says now about adversity. She says, adversity helped to remove the fluff from our faith and to make it rock solid. Perspective makes all the difference in how we view the story. And as she looks at her grandchildren and she tells her friends, you know, I have no regret. I have only blessings. And as we close today, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I wanna challenge us when we go through struggle, we have two lenses that we can use. We can use the lens of frustration or we can use the lens of faith. When you go to, go to the eye doctor and they put your face up to that machine and they flip down the different lenses and they ask you, which one's better? Which is the better lens to look through? Could it be that we're looking at our stories through the wrong lens? And if we simply flip down to a different lens, we could see a better story. Maybe where we see trials, God sees training. Where we see struggle, God sees strength building. Where we see failure, God sees a future. Where we see problems, God sees promises. Where we see probable defeat, God sees ultimate victory. Where we see past pain, God sees that the best is yet to come. Joseph didn't see his life as a disappointment. Joseph didn't see his life as wasted years. Joseph didn't see his life as a failure. Joseph saw his life as a life of purpose. Just because something takes our lives in an unexpected direction doesn't mean that God had a hiccup in his master plan. Joseph said what happened to him happened just as God intended. You intended this for evil. God intended this for good. Joseph flipped the lens. He chose not to focus on the lower story. He chose to focus on the upper story and what God was doing. I just wanna leave you with this verse before we take communion. It's from Romans. It says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's what God was doing in Joseph's life and that is what God can do in your life if you choose to live your life by faith rather than live your life by frustration. I want to turn it over to Pastor Mike as he leads us through communion today. At Hillcrest Church, we celebrate an open communion, meaning if you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we encourage you to celebrate, celebrate this act of communion with us. If, uh, if you miss the communion elements coming in or you need a gluten-free option, just raise your hand and one of the ushers will come by and they'll hand that to you. Reading from the book of John, I just want to share a verse with you for you to meditate and think about as we listen to the team, as the team uh, leads us in a little bit of worship and helps us focus. Jesus said in John chapter 6, he said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I offer so that the world may live is my flesh. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me, and in the same way anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven, and anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, but will live forever. So let's think on these words. We're going to sing My Hope is Built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. In Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's blood. said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we, um, we humbly come before you to recognize, recognizing what you've done for us. The perfect life you lived the love you showed us, the example you gave us. Father, sacrifice you made for each and every one of us when you gave your life to die on that cross, to pay the payment for our sins, that by accepting you, we might be free. So Father, you gave all for us. May we give back to you all that we have. Help us, Lord, to recognize and look through the eyes of faith and see that there's a greater work. Lord, I pray that you don't take away those burdens from us, those difficulties, those challenges. But Lord, help us to recognize them. Help us to grow in them. Help us even to, in some way, celebrate and thank you for them, knowing that you're building into us, that you're caring for us. You want us to be more like you, that we might have freedom, freedom from our sins. So, Father, your people come before you with bowed heads and bowed hearts because we love you. And so, Lord, we give you this day. We give you our week. May you be glorified in everything that we say and everything that we do. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, I'm so glad to see all of you out without masks. I can see some faces. It sure looks good. Um, just a couple announcements on the first Sunday of the month, we do a community cares offering. And it's an offering that we take to give to many of the needs of the city, like the furniture ministry, like community care bags for those in need. So if you would like to give to that, the ushers will be taking that as you go out. And as well, if the Lord's been speaking to you, and I know he has, and you need prayer, we have a prayer room at the back and to the right. There's people who want to pray with you, or if you want to pray by yourself, take that opportunity and uh, use that room and pray with and for one another. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or even imagine, through his power that's at work within us, be glory in this church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and evermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Blessings to you. Have a wonderful day. Go get some cinnamon buns and coffee. Stick around.